My name is Emma Merzik, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for Blue Ocean Society for Marine Conservation. We are a nonprofit based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and our mission is to protect marine life in the Gulf of Maine through research, education, and inspiring action. This is the first of our weekly themes that we will be unveiling throughout the summer. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about marine debris and its effects on the marine environment, as well as the animals that live there, and then what you can do to help. But before I tuck into that, I just want to touch a little bit on the major programs that we run at Blue Ocean. We have our marine debris research and cleanups. So since 2001, Blue Ocean has been running public cleanups at Genesee Beach. And we also offer private cleanups to groups and organizations in the area. And this is not just a day picking up trash at the beach. Rather, participants are encouraged to be scientists for the day. And while at the cleanup, they fill out data cards so we can track the different types of marine debris that we are finding and notice trends in debris from year to year. We also offer outreach to schools. So you may have seen this guy. This is Ladder. He is an inflatable, life-sized fin whale. Um, students are actually able to go inside this whale. And he is modeled after a real whale that we used to see in the Gulf of Maine. We also have the Blue Ocean Discovery Center. Um, if you've been down to Hampton Beach, maybe you visited us here. Um, we're right next to the seashell stage and we've got um, touch tanks where you can handle different marine creatures and marine invertebrates and then learn about local whale species. We also have our whale watches and whale research. So we partner with Granite State Whale Watch in Rye Harbor, New Hampshire. And we conduct research while on the boat, identifying local humpback and fin whales as well as different animals of local concern. And while on the boat, our interns and naturalists not only conduct research, but they also educate passengers about whales and marine species, and then what they can do to help protect the marine environment. So if you have ever been to the beach in New Hampshire, then you have been to the Gulf of Maine. Um, and if you see that little yellow rectangle, that is Jeffrey's Ledge. Um, Jeffrey's Ledge is a 33 mile long rocky outcropping off of the coast of New Hampshire. It's located at the tip of Cape Ann up to about Cape Elizabeth and Maine. And the depth on the ledge is between 140 and 240 feet. But um, the depth can be up to 600 feet surrounding the ledge. Because of this steep decrease in depth, there is upwelling, which allows for many nutrients to come to the surface, which makes this a very productive habitat for whales and marine life. And Blue Ocean is a unique organization because our research is primarily focused on Jeffrey's Ledge um, rather than all over. So who lives in the Gulf of Maine? We see a variety of different marine animals living in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, most famously, we have our whale species, such as fin and humpback whales. We also see fish, such as this ocean sunfish, also known as a mola mola. Um, we also see plankton. And then closer to the shore, we see seabirds, such as gulls and terns, as well as invertebrate species, such as sea stars and urchins. These invertebrates do live farther out in the ocean as well, but um, as beachgoers, we typically see them closer to shore in tide pools. Lastly, sea turtles can live in the Gulf of Maine. You have to be out rather far to see them, but there are several species that live here. Um, we'll see leatherbacks and Atlantic Ridleys. So here is a fin whale. Fin whales are the second largest species of whales. Blue whales are the only whales larger than them. Um, they're named for their distinct fin on their back um, near their tails. These guys are between 60 and 80 feet in length and between 50 and 70 tons. They are one of the fastest whales in the world and can reach up to 35 miles an hour. They also have asymmetrical coloring on their head extending into their jaw. Here we have a humpback whale. Um, these guys are probably the most famous around New England. Um, in fact, their scientific name actually means long-winged New Englander and they're named because of their long pectoral fins. Um, these guys can be between 40 and 50 feet long and 30 to 40 tons. And males sing in their breeding ground, so each male sings the same song, but the song changes slightly each year. And here is a wonderful image of a humpback whale breaching, and you can see their long pectoral fin up in the air. Here is a minke whale. 
Minke whales are the smallest of the rorqual or baleen whales. They're only between 20 and 30 feet long, so still fairly large, but not as big as their fin whale counterpart. Um, and they're about six to eight tons. Their nickname is Little Piked Whale because of its sharp pointed snout like that of a pikefish. And here you see some Atlantic white-sided dolphins. Um, so dolphins are toothed whales. Um, and toothed whales and baleen whales are all part of the cetacean family. So dolphins are in fact whales. These guys are between seven and nine feet long and about 400 to 600 pounds. When feeding, dolphins work cooperatively in pods and they also use echolocation to find their food. Some other species to mention, basking sharks. These are the second largest species of shark. Um, these guys can get up to about 26 feet long. Here is an ocean sunfish. You may have heard them be called mola mola. They love to sunbathe um, and they can actually weigh more than a car. So they can be about 2.5 tons. So they're not a small fish. Here um, is a seal. We see a fair amount of seals in the Gulf of Maine. We'll find harbor seals, gray seals, hooded seals, and harp seals. Gray and harbor seals are seen year round, whereas hooded and harp seals winter here. And they come down from the North Atlantic and Arctic Oceans. And then here we've got um, a seabird, and we'll see a fair amount of these guys um, out on the water as well as inland. So what is marine debris? Marine debris is trash um, or litter. It's human created waste that is either intentionally or unintentionally disposed of into the marine environment or Great Lakes. And there are a lot of ways that marine debris can enter the marine environment. So open trash cans is one of them. People properly disposing of their trash by putting it into a garbage bin. However, either, is too, either there is too much waste and it's overflowing, um, allowing trash to escape, or in some towns, bins provided don't even have lids, allowing trash to escape quite easily. I'm sure everybody has seen this, unfortunately. Beachgoers um, enjoy a wonderful day out um, on the beach, um, but then they end up leaving all of their garbage behind, um, which can be a real issue because tides and wind can cause the trash to enter the marine environment. Um, it's especially funny because, you know, you have to pass trash cans often when you leave beaches. So we'll see that all too commonly. Um, living on the seacoast of New England, there are a lot of fishing communities. Fishing gear such as ropes and nets along with lobster traps are very prevalent on beaches. And again, this is to no fault of fishermen in the area. Um, often tides can bring these in from the ocean and they'll wash up on the shore. Um, we are not allowed to remove such debris um, at Blue Ocean Society because they are the property of the lobstermen. Um, so the only people who are allowed to remove these from the beach are the lobstermen themselves or fish and game. Um, we also find uh, microbeads. Um, so we'll find these in health and beauty products. Often they're used as exfoliants. They're too small to be caught in wastewater treatment facilities, so they end up in the marine environment. And the fish don't like any of this in their homes. Um, issues with microplastics are that they are so small and they can look like food to different animals. If ingested, they can cause many problems for marine animals, um, getting lodged in their stomachs or intestines, blocking their digestive systems and depriving them of nutrients from real food. This is an image of a small zooplankton. And if you see those bright green bits in its digest digestive tract, that is actually small bits of microplastic. Um, and these guys are kind of the base of the food chain. So a lot of different animals eat them. Um, so imagine you're a fish and you're eating hundreds of these in a day. You might accidentally be ingesting hundreds of small pieces of microplastic. And we call this biomagnification when accumulation of a particular substance, in this case plastic, in the body of an organism um, ends up going through the different trophic levels of the food chain. Here is an example of some marine debris, um, and this is a basking shark, and you can see it is entangled in it just about around its nose. Um, and it was a little bit of plastic, and there's the arrow showing you where it is. 
Here we see a seabird uh, entangled in some fishing line and you can see it's about at its foot. And you can see a, there's a lure in its foot, but then there's also some fishing line flying behind it. And then this is probably everyone has seen this video of a turtle with a straw in its nose. Um, this is kind of the poster turtle for um, the skip the straw movement. Um, there were scientists conducting research on sea turtles in Costa Rica and they found this guy with a straw in its nose and they were able to remove it and the turtle was able to swim off. And then lastly, um, this was a beached whale found with 30 plastic bags crammed in its belly. Um, if you've ever seen a plastic bag in water, it does look similar to a jellyfish. So many animals think it's food. Um, as I was saying before, animals that mistake marine debris for food end up having issues because that marine debris can block their digestive systems and prevent them from getting nutrients from real food. So this is a graph um, showing the top 10 items that collected in 2019, just in New Hampshire at beach cleanups. In total, we had about 240 cleanups in 2019. So this shows the breakdown. You can see the number one item that we find at beach cleanups are cigarette butts. Um, we found over 30,000 just at cleanups in New Hampshire, not including Massachusetts and Maine. If you imagine that a cigarette butt weighs a few ounces, um, we picked up over 100 pounds just in cigarette butts. Other items to mention, the second largest category was plastic pieces that are smaller than 2.5 centimeters. Often larger pieces of plastic fragment um, or break apart into smaller pieces. Because plastic never really leaves the marine environment or any environment, it can't break down, it, but it can break into smaller pieces. Um, and this can happen uh, because of wave action and the sun can weaken the plastic as well. Um, and again, these small pieces of plastic um, can turn into microplastics that different animals will mistake for food and ingest. And here is the top 10 breakdown for New Hampshire again, but in a bit of an easier format to read. So just to end this quick video um, with some follow up questions for you and your families to talk about and discuss. Um, what can you do to prevent marine debris from entering the marine environment? Why do you think marine environment or marine debris is harmful to wildlife? What are some ways that marine debris gets into the ocean? And then what are hooks at disks and what is their story? So throughout the week, we will be posting some different activities on the Blue Ocean Society website. And these different activities will help you answer these follow-up questions. So stay tuned and thank you for listening.